That means we can start with our conversation on building a political commitment to crisis prevention, strengthening delivery. As I mentioned earlier, we have two experts with us today. First of all, it's Dr. Hannah Neumann. She's a member of the European Parliament. She's the Peace and Human Rights Coordinator for the Greens EFA Group. She's Vice Chair of the Human Rights Committee, member of the Committees of Foreign Affairs, Security and Defense Policy, and Chair of the Delegation for Relations to the Arabian Peninsula. Hannah studied and received her PhD in Media Sciences and Peace and Conflict Research, and before she joined the European Parliament, she worked as a peace practitioner. And on her website, she says, for peace, I spare no conflict. Welcome again, Hannah. Second expert is Daryl Rodriguez Torres, the Executive Director of the Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict, GPEC. GPEC is a member-led network of civil society organizations active in the field of conflict, pre conflict prevention and peace building across the world. Daryl is an international relations specialist with broad experience conducting conflict analysis, political risk assessments, and articulating multi-stakeholder processes for conflict prevention and peace building. Welcome, Darren L. In our first session of this summer dialogue, we talked about the change within the UN system towards a stronger focus on conflict prevention. In week two, we looked at the potential of big data and AI for this field of work. Last week, we talked about how all the information and analysis can support faster responses by international organizations, policymakers, and stakeholders. And today, in this final session, we want to look at what can be done to put pressure on policymakers and generate momentum towards this political will. We've mentioned this throughout all three sessions that we apparently need a better political will, a stronger political will in this field of work. Picking up on Adriana Abdenor's idea in our first session of grading the UN for its transformation process, I would first of all like to look at the current modus operandi in crisis and conflict prevention. And my question to you, Hannah and Darinell, is if you were to grade on a scale of one, the lowest, to 10, the highest mark, how would you rate the political commitment and will to make prevention a priority over peacemaking and keeping activities? Let's start with Hannah. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for having me with you and thank you for starting with such a tough question. Um, if I had to put it in one grain at the European level, I, I think I would sadly have to put it with a three, but let me qualify because I think there is a lot of ambition and a lot of political will and a lot of language and a lot of thinking going into it. So on that, I would give the EU maybe an eight. But then if I look at the outcome and how often we just get overrun by the reality and about the ad hoc conflicts and how we have to deal with that and respond to that. So let me talk Syria, Libya, the killing of, 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 of Soleimani, all these things that just happen and that then take all the attention on, on the many different levels. That's how with even this, this big ambition, and I even think there is a true political will to that, um, if you look at the output, often conflict prevention falls behind the other levels, sadly. And the question for me would therefore be, how do we actually manage to go from the three to the eight? Um, so that's why I would give it a three. Also, I think in theory, everybody supports the idea. Thank you. We will probably get a little more into this after Darino has given his mark. Yeah, well, thank you. Uh, I would agree with, with Hannah in the sense that it depends what you ask, how you frame the question, and who, who do you apply it to. Uh, I would say if we talk about, say, multilateral organizations, including the EU, uh, although it's not necessarily, no, it's not exactly a multilateral organization, but what, including it is a big peace building actor, the UN, for example, regional organizations, big multilaterals, the World Bank, uh, World Bank maybe a little less, but if you look at, at, the, at the staff or at the commitment, at the leadership of multilateral organizations, the grade would be relatively high, I would say seven to eight, into you know, the, you know, what, what Secretary General of the UN wants to do, etc. There is a high 
there's a big uh, priority given to prevention in the discourse and in the doing in the organization of, of uh, the structures of, of these organizations. However, when you look at the member states of these organizations, which at the end are the ones who really have to you know, implement and to allow preventive activities to happen, then the commitment goes much, much lower. Uh, I would say, yeah, maybe around three, four to be generous, depending on the member state, uh, because then that, that, of course, there are big differences also. Uh, so, yeah, I guess it, it depends on, on what you want to see, how do you want to see it. If we talk about the idea, the policy discourse behind prevention, I think there is a, a much, there's a good picture compared to 15 years ago, for example. Now you don't have to make the case for prevention no longer. There seems to be kind of like a consensus that, okay, it's, it's, it's good. But then when we go into the doing and to actually, and, and, and even better, when we go into where the money goes, <laughs> We see that really prevention, uh, that this course is not necessarily matched by uh, the funds that go there. Thank you. Actually, YZ in session two asked the question, you know, why shouldn't we invest the same amount of money in prevention than, let's say, in um, space activities? Um, because there's, you know, there seems to be a consensus that prevention is necessary, but there seems to be not enough action. Um, Hannah, let me go back to you with your experience in the European Parliament. You said that there's a lot of ambition, there's will, there are a lot of initiatives. Um, what, what's the missing link between that and the action? What's your experience? What have you witnessed? What do you see in your day-to-day -day work? Um, where we could actually, you know, improve, and then you know, later on maybe we can also talk about what needs to be done to improve that. The missing link. Well, the 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 initial answer that popped into my head was the missing link is the urgency. But you cannot do much on the urgency because if um, we want to talk about prevention and then it's urgent, then it's no longer prevention, but then it's actual action. Um, but Maybe to, to bring it to, to, to also the EU and how, how it works and how um, conflict prevention is built into the idea of how we do foreign policy may help it, to explain it a bit. So what the EU has done, and I think the idea is brilliant, it is working with something it calls the integrated approach. So the idea is basically to address all conflict dimensions, so security, the hardcore security, development, economy aspects and during all phases of conflict. So not to separate it between like, um, this is conflict prevention, this is working on, post on conflict, this is working on post-conflict, this is in rehabilitation, but to kind of bring everything together. And I think from like a conflict person, like I was a peace and conflict researcher and practitioner before, I think this is how it's supposed to be because you have a, you, you have a situation, you don't have a stage or a policy area, but you have a situation you have to deal with. But the problem that comes with it is that where, how do we prioritize? Where do we put our resources? Our resources in terms of attention and our resources in terms of money. And as a politician and also as someone working, for example, in the European External Action Service, you tend to put your limited resources to where most of the pressure is. And most of the pressure is usually not before the escalation or when it slowly ramps up, but most of the pressure is where we have the biggest disaster. And why, from an analytical point of view, this integrated approach is brilliant, it becomes exactly then problematic if we don't have a separate budget or a separate unit or a separate headspace going into prevention, and then it's eaten up by the more seemingly more urgent things. And that's why I think it is very important that, especially you as the civil society or those who want to push prevention and who know there is a general willingness to work on it, help us. And I really mean it that way. Help us to move at least a bit of headspace resources and focus to the conflict prevention. What we are trying to do, for example, with the upcoming budget negotiations as Greens, because we know of these problems, is to make sure that we have a separate amount of money going into prevention. Because we also know if there is that budget that goes into prevention and every EU delegation would have that budget, at least towards October, people would have to put some 
some headspace into what do we do with that money usefully. And then you have that opening for prevention. But I also think if you concretely see that there is like a ramp up and it would need conflict prevention now, to really approach, for example, people who work in delegations on that specific country, or to approach people who work on that specific issue like LGBTI rights or land rights or whatever is the case, but with concrete steps they can take. So there's one thing that we need to do conflict prevention. Well, okay, I have like a full schedule, what on earth am I supposed to do? Or are you telling me we really need to make sure that we work on the electoral districts in Equatorial Guinea because otherwise in the next election we'll see this and that. And then I would know what to do. So that's, I think, a bit how we may be able, in the current system, to bridge that gap. Thank you. Darren, I'll, to you, from your perspective, uh, working you know, in civil society organizations um, for many, many years, what's the missing link on the political level? What have you witnessed? What are your thoughts? You need to unmute. When okay. I was listening to Hannah, uh, it came to mind, there is a famous movie, Spanish movie, called uh, Why Do We Call It Love When We Mean Sex? You know, so in this case, I was thinking, why do we call it prevention when we mean crisis management, you know, in the sense, you know, in the, uh, so a lot of the budget and a lot of the allocations that supposedly go to prevention, to peace building, they're really focused on crisis management and they really focus on, you know, hardcore security approaches. If we go to the EU, we are now focusing on the security ring of the EU. You know, we're talking about, okay, what is the national security of those contributing to prevention, to prevention policies? And, it, and, and really, it's, you know, we're missing that link of the real prevention that has to be done and where it has to be done, um, which maybe it's not necessarily the stability ring, but maybe it has to, you know, to go to, be, to look beyond, beyond that. So there is one, you know, one of the links is, is um, taking a broader approach to, to, to prevention, you know, to the, uh, not only the linking a little bit or, or, or counter this tendency, this trend that there is to have peace building, but more in general, all development policy, uh, not having this global outlook anymore, but looking more into okay, what is the short-term national interest and how can I show uh, sellable results. You know? So I understand there is a lot of pressure on the behalf of parliaments, on behalf of political decision makers to show to their constituency that the investments that they're making are, are good investments. But then this, unfortunately, this takes us to a situation where if we talk about prevention, if we talk about peace building, if we talk about development in general, these are very, very long-term processes. Sometimes they, you don't have sexy results to show in the long, in the short term. Uh, and, and this trend that I understand this pressure to, to show results becomes detrimental for peace building work that requires a more long term approach, long term thinking, the development of partnerships, etc. So when Hannah says help us, I, I do believe that, you know, help us help you. Yes, uh, we can help to some extent in the sense that don't expect, you know, these success stories, there was this huge crisis and these conflict preventers came and everything was solved and great story. We might have stories like that, but they will take years to develop, years to be built. And uh, there has to be this, this understanding, this awareness uh, that that's the way it happens. In that sense, I think another missing link is creating this sense of awareness of what peace building work is among the broader public. Because most of the public, and including many policy makers, many political decision makers, are not familiar with what the work of a peace builder or what the peace building approach is, what are the advantages, etc. So I think there is a need to do, those of us who work on peace building, to do some outreach, even to the general public and also to more specialized uh, decision makers about what prevention is actually is, what peace building actually is. This is something that you don't have to explain when you work in the human rights field. You know, everybody knows what a human rights advocate does. You know, everybody knows what a climate change advocate does. But uh, when you say, oh, I'm a peace builder, you get like these faces like, you're what? So what you do what? And what does that mean? So there is no this knowledge, and hence there is no this demand from the public 
own people to on their um, representatives to say, hey, no, I want you to do prevention and I want you to be accountable to do better peace building or better prevention policies, simply because I don't know what that is and what advantages that brings outside, but also inside for myself, for my country, for my community. So I would highlight those two missing links. So I hear, um, first of all, Darren, I've never heard conflict prevention and sex in the same sentence. So I got to hand it to you. That's a narrative. It worked on me, but um, you know, not, it's not the time to joke in this field of work, but um, what could be in your experience, Darren L. First, and then maybe Hannah, what's the kind of narrative that civil society uh, could create that would actually make the urgency or create the urgency that Hannah says, you know, is, is a prerequisite in her kind of work because she has limited time, there are limited budgets, you know, there's limited um, resources in pretty much every field. So what, what could be a narrative from your years of experience that could work a little better to create more political will and to create the urgency for prevention rather than, you know, it's happened, so now it's urgent. Yeah, I mean, I think the narrative or the basis, the building block of a narrative are there. You know, we have uh, a lot of work that has been on even in the past couple of years, uh, making the business case for prevention. That, you know, uh, the World Bank issued this report, Pathways for Peace, just a couple of years ago, where they essentially try to bring evidence and make the build, you know, the, the case for, for prevention and show some, some um, evidence of how this could, could work. So, so, I mean, the technical case, I think, is, is there. I think there is maybe more of a need to, to bring stories of prevention uh, outside to the, to, to the non-expert audience, including the decision makers who are non-experts. You know? And that's that's a bit a demand that we have heard from some of our um, donors. Uh, they say, well, help us, help us grasp what you do, but in, in, in a way that, uh, uh, that, that it can be easily communicated. So when we talk about narratives, we see that uh, we're facing that problem now with a lot of narratives of fear, a lot of narratives that really what they try to do is spark um, division, polarization, and they use emotions very well to do that. And I think part of what we're not doing good enough as a peace building community is to use not only rational, objective, you no know, academic arguments, but emotional arguments. That's what I think we have to see how we can transmit to the emotions uh, what, what, what prevention work is, what the narrative is. Um, I just want to end before saying uh, the importance of developing an emotional narrative. I think it was Maja Angelo who said, you know, uh, people may forget what you told them, people might forget what you did to them, but people will never forget how you made them feel. So we have to approach this also from an emotional narrative um, approach and, and make the case, bring stories of how prevention affects real people's lives, how peace building is actually changing the lives of people in, in those places where it is being applied properly. I see you going like this, Hannah. So. You don't totally agree, totally disagree? I'm, I, I would like to say something maybe complementary. So I think the case on the economic and abstract level of why prevention is better than reaction has been made with that pathways to peace and, and, and all these, these other studies. And on a rational level, it's understood, it's checked. I think telling success stories is never a bad example, also to make people understand what prevention can actually do and also where, where it's limited and to help all those who want to champion prevention to, to help champion prevention. But if you want politicians to act or to make sure that it is being acted on a specific case where we need prevention, that general stuff about why prevention is good and where else prevention has helped, is not what we need, but we need a compelling case. So it needs to be in country A, we see the threat for conflict to escalate because of, and this is, if we do this and that and that, we think it would prevent this escalation. So please make sure through all your channels that this is 
we can raise awareness and that these steps are being taken. Basically, that is, if you want a concrete prevention thing to happen, the way you should go. So one is having like all these structures and understandings and people and, and theoretical budget. But for me, to a large extent, it's there. The question is just why is it always falling down the priority list? And to put it up on the priority list, we need concrete cases to push. And I think you should work on concrete cases to push as well. Thank you. Um, we are in this, you know, pandemic situation globally, and we've seen that things can be very high on the agenda, you know, very quickly. Is there a lesson to be learned from these lessons that we just learned? Is, is there something in it also for crisis prevention? Hannah? When, when, we, when we went through this COVID experience, I was actually reminded a lot of the, the thinking and the discussions that we are having in the peacebuilding community for a long time on prevention. Because once and for all, we managed to kind of have a strong preventive response for this COVID. So, I mean, we could have even been earlier, but in general, I mean, it didn't escalate. We had this super strong lockdown and everything response. We had this scale up of everything. It all just focused on preventing this very big pandemic to happen. And we were successful, at least as of now. Let's see about the second wave. But at the moment, I would say we were successful in this prevention. And rather than just applauding us for being super successful on this prevention, we now have all this discussion, was it necessary? Did we have to put so much energy? Was it really necessary to, 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 to clamp down on the economy, such, such big, and, 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 and all these steps? And I think in a second wave, there will not be such a huge preventive effort and action to take place. So it kind of brings this paradox of prevention that has been rather limited to our, like, our peace building community experience to the society as a whole. And it may, on the one hand, I mean, support the understanding of this issue. And it may, if, 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 if we, and as I think especially civil society does this in a very deliberate attempt, also help others understand why we need prevention and also how hard it is to sell it to the very end, wh whether or not it was successful. Um, but that was for me maybe a side of the fact that, of course, lots of the problems in the system have come out stronger in the pandemic was for me the, the key takeaway of it in, in, in just my brain and how it works and what I focus on. Thank you. Darren, I'll, did you take something away for prevention work? You need to unmute, please. Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, there is... There are a lot of studies and there are even organizations that compare the development of uh, violence or the way that violence spreads the way that a pandemic spreads. You know, there is a, there are, you know, and there are remarkable parallels between, between these two and also between the health approach and how does the health approach uh, could be uh, used in the conflict prevention security areas. At the end, you can do, there, there are two elements, you know, and also for the health approach. Of course, for when you're talking about health prevention, you do broad campaigns, creating awareness, uh, making people really uh, conscious of what they need to do in order to prevent themselves. Uh, but at the end, when you go to vaccinate people, you, know, you have to go by one by one. <laughs> no. At the same time, you know, we can create great campaigns on prevention and security, conflict prevention, but when you go there, you have to do uh, work. I'm not saying one by one, but you have to go very almost one by one on very local community level, and and people. You no, know, it's a change that people really has to feel, uh, almost at the personal level, almost a personal transformation. Uh, and so, so we need those two approaches: you know, the big macro uh, campaigning approach, but also the individual approach uh, that makes change happen at the more uh, micro level. Um, and you know there are. Somebody was asking about, about successes of prevention. I mean, we could mention uh, different, but I would say one of the lessons that we have had from, from prevention or one of the things that we were saying is uh, prevention and peace building in general is you know, what, what is peace, basically? How can we measure peace? You know, and essentially, we measure peace when people, um, when people are less fearful 
of their everyday life. You know, when people who had their everyday life interrupted somehow and they, they saw you know, they mistrust, violence, etc., they can go back to a normal normal life. And how do we see that? You, know, you have to go really, really local you know, and go into communities and see, okay, how has your life changed? You know, is it changing for the best? Are you feeling more secure? Are you feeling more trustful of your uh, neighbor, et cetera? Or are you, is it changing for the worse? Are your levels of fear increasing and your levels of mistrust? You know? And that's how you, we, have, we have to see. You know? And I, I have a, a, quickly, you know, a story of a project we were doing in Colombia a couple of years ago. We were having this... Um, uh, intergenerational dialogues in some of the communities that were very, very affected by violence over the past 15 years, small communities. No? So a year, a couple of years after those dialogues and a year after the signing of the peace agreement, we got these people together and we asked them, have you seen any changes in your life? And they said, well, yeah, actually. Say, okay, tell me what changes do you see one year after the signing of the peace agreement? And I said, well, for example, in my town, um, the 8 p.m. mass uh, was canceled for the past 10 years. The past 10 years, there was no 8 p.m. mass because people were afraid to go out when it was dark. Uh, there was you no know, uh, fear that they were going to be mugged or uh, raped or you know, violent. Uh, something was bad is going to happen to them. So now one year after the sign of the peace agreement, we have our 8 p.m. mass back. You know? And that is the social event of the town. And you know, we're talking about towns of you know, 2,000 people or something. And that's, like, that's where you know, people socialize. And that, that may seem to us as a very small change, is a very significant change for, 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 for people, no? And peace is the collection of smaller, significant changes that happen to all of us, after all, and that we have to see how we can translate to the macro level. Thank you. Um, let's talk about, you know, maybe missing actors in this field of work and in the political arena when we talk about crisis prevention. What... Yeah. More women in this area up the ante, Hannah. Unmute, please. Sorry, I thought the, so you were doing it. Okay. <laughs> well, more women in this area. Um, that again, here we have the numbers. I mean, we have the numbers that, for example, peace negotiations are more successful, especially in the longer term, the more women sit on the table. But if I look at the numbers of women sitting on the table, it's not that people have taken this lesson into account. And I think this is very problematic. And so I, I, I'm just trying to explain often in, in my work on gender equality, why, so it's not just the numbers. And I mean, for me, it's this, I mean, all the societies and especially societies where we have this conflict between groups are diverse. And the key challenge is how to make this diversity constructive and make it useful for the society and not just continuing these destructive patterns that lead to the conflict and often to, to civil war and other things. And if we want to, to work on this and capitalize on this diversity, I think we need to bring it to the table and to the decision making and to the outline of the projects and women are part of this diversity. And that's why I just think the more diverse on every level and on every project, the teams are, the groups are, the negotiators are, the mediators are, and the better the solutions are in the long run. And I think that, that we absolutely need to cherish and thereby diversity also becomes a major resource for me for, for conflict prevention because we have all these voices on the table already and if we empower them to also speak up, because sometimes we have the women just sit there, but they feel they feel totally un, un, unsecure in this situation, and then they just sit there because we need women to sit there, but it's not that they engage as everybody else. But the more we have this diversity in, in the discussion, in the setup, the less we need to sort it out in the end if we realize it doesn't fit. And that's why, well, the easiest and the, the most easy to, to like check and evaluate claim is having women on the negotiation table because we are not even there but that could just be a starting point that I also want to make very clear because it's just one aspect of diversity thank you what's your experience um, on the ground Darren unmute please yeah thanks thank you no I mean I, I agree with uh, Hannah's remarks I would I would like to maybe take the question more to the broader inclusivity um, uh, area because 
going back to the comparison with the healthcare center, sector and, uh, and uh, peace building, you know, healthcare, in order to control this pandemic, we have need, we needed uh, a number of people from different sources of life to play their role. You know, we needed, yes, of course, the health ministries and the governments, but we also needed the, uh, you know, small towns, but we also needed the schools, but we also needed the restaurants. We also, we know, we also needed you know, associations. We needed everybody really to, to play their role to do this. And in a way, crisis prevention, conflict prevention is, is, is similar to this in, in the sense that it requires a whole of society approach. <laughs> For, for, for it to be successful. So it requires the engagement of or really uh, big segments, big parts of society, of course, women including, youth included. Uh, but, 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 but the overall concept is like, no, this has to be a whole of society effort as we are doing right now with the pandemic. Same for controlling uh, violence, for controlling crisis uh, and potential conflict. Uh, I think the problem that we see is that even, even, even when we talk about the efforts in prevention, we focus on some actors, usually governmental actors, or hard, no, and some of the actors are not empowered to play the role that is expected to do from them and that is needed from them. So there is a need to really uh, empower these actors, to really facilitate, to really, uh, really empower is the word because there is a power imbalance. No, even if, you know, if I want to play this role, I need some some commission, some empowerment to be able to play my role, whether it is you know, from the women perspective, from the youth perspective, from the community, grassroots organizations, whatever it is. I'm, I'm part of, of, of what, uh, what I would be critical about the approach to prevention is that I don't think that's happening necessarily and we are not really uh, empowering all the actors and then we say and we know that we need for prevention to be successful, you know? um, and then no, there are in that case you no. Know, even with with countries that have for a long time supported peace building prevention efforts, there are some trends that I would consider worrying in that sense of uh, promoting some imbalances rather than than uh, trying to uh, you know enhance uh, people's roles in in this. Mm -hmm.